Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Now, I was asked to give a sermon on courage versus fear in a series of sermons on virtues versus vices. And that sets me thinking about what people would usually be fearful of. So may I ask you, what is your greatest fear? What are you most afraid of? I remember when I was in junior college, I chose to study Cambridge A-levels physics. On the first lesson with my physics teacher, he discouraged us from studying A-levels physics, citing examples of how my seniors have failed and the topics were way more difficult than the Cambridge O-levels physics. And up to today, I can still remember what he said at the end of his introduction speech. Be afraid. Be very afraid. And he thought that he was being humorous, but I did not find it amusing at all. Because this is what happened to me, that I was frightened by him and had second thoughts about studying physics. This is exactly what fear can do to us, isn't it? It makes us have second thoughts of continuing what we set out to do. Fear may cripple us to the point where we give up. And this is not how God wants us to live our Christian life. I hope today we will allow God to speak to us so that we can live our Christian life victoriously and courageously and not be defeated by fear. So let's go to God in prayer, ask of Him to do His wondrous work in us as we listen to His Word. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we admit that we struggle with fears at times that draw us away from You. We pray that You will address this area of our life today and speak to us through Your Word so that we can be transformed by You. Now as we prepare ourselves to listen to Your Word, help us to be attentive and ready to obey. May the meditation of our hearts and the words from my mouth be pleasing to You as You lead and guide us through this sermon time together. Thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the outline for today's sermon, as you can see on the screen, is firstly on understanding fear. How fear can affect us. Why do we become fearful? And is it a sin? Is it wrong to be afraid or lack of courage? Next, we'll look at understanding courage, how courage can make a difference in the way we live our life. What does it mean to be a courageous Christian and how to be one? Last but not least, we will venture into managing and overcoming fears, how we can practically live different from before. How are we going to move away from our usual way of handling fear? How can we practically live our life courageously as overcomers? I need you to participate with me. A good way to start today's sermon is to ask all of you to individually identify one significant fear that you presently have and then see how this fear is explained and discover how God wants you to overcome it. So please participate. Pause and think of one fear that affects you most presently. What is your number one fear? Think. Think about it. Now, please don't come up with answers like fear of lizards or cockroaches. Yeah? All right? I, I, don't, I don't think insects are your number one fear. Or is it? I don't think so, right? So think again. What are you most afraid of that God wants you to overcome? It can be related to work or school or at home 
or even about church ministry. Has everyone thought of at least one present number one fear in your life? I hope it's not a person, yeah. Think of one number one fear, okay? All right, let's start with understanding fear. Now, I searched the internet to find out what people are afraid of. And I found this top 10 fears as you can see on the screen. And you may be able to identify with one of them. Or maybe your greatest fear is the fear of failure or the fear of rejection. These are two common fears that teenagers or even adults have. Fear of failure or fear of rejection. Now, humans are plagued with all kinds of fear. No one can say that he or she is not afraid of anything. So this makes today's sermon relevant to everyone. And there are many things that we can talk about fear. All right, Instead of talking about many things about fear, I think that all fears can be narrowed down. All, right? all fears can be narrowed down and put into three categories, which are needs, problems, and sins. Now, there are fears regarding not having our basic needs for food and security met, or even about our weaknesses and our inadequacies. So there are people who are daily afraid of not able to meet the target or to provide for themselves or for their families. And then we also have problems in life, in school, at work and at home. Problems in life also create fear as we are worried that we are not able to solve the problems and make them go away. And then it leads us to the decline of mental wellness. Next, we have sins that, cause, that enslave us to the point that we are fearful of the consequences and that God would reject us. Somehow we cannot escape from needs, problems and sins. Can you pick the category which your number one fear falls under? In fact, the Bible is full of stories about godly people being fearful in each of the three categories. Even prophets, apostles and godly people encountered fear in their life and sometimes they succumbed to it. Now, in the category of needs, as you can see on the screen, we have Moses in Exodus 4. We see Moses was paralyzed by his own fear of failure in the task set before him by God. He couldn't help but see his own perceived inadequacies, which include a speech impediment. And Moses even asked if God has chosen the wrong person. Next, we have Elijah in the category of problems. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah was filled with fear when he heard that Queen Jezebel was searching for him in order to kill him that he literally ran for his life until he was exhausted and then lay down under a tree and begged God to end his life because he was defeated in mind and body. And then we have Apostle Simon Peter, who was in the category of sins. In Matthew chapter 26, Peter was so stricken with guilt because he sinned against Lord, the Lord Jesus by denying him three times that he ran away and hide in fear and shame. Now, if we zoom in and narrow them even further and find the cause of all fears, I would say that the reason for all fears is the uncertainty of the future and its consequences. All of us here have lived through the COVID pandemic. And I do not have to further elaborate how uncertainty of the future and its consequences can make the whole world fearful. Many times you are fearful because of the uncertainty that lies ahead. So, it is normal that people like you and me are frightened by things 
that God asks us to do or by experiences that will require us to venture into the unknown. In fact, there are 159 verses in the Bible that God tells us not to fear and verses that talk about men becoming fearful. Hence, it shows that it is a common thing. And God understands that we would naturally fear. One of the famous verses is from Psalms chapter 34, verse 4. And I read, I sought the Lord, and He answered me, and He delivered me from all my fears. From here, we can conclude that we all have experienced fear, and it is normal. And being afraid does not disqualify us from being accepted by God. In fact, the fear of bad consequences is a good thing and necessary thing so that we do not do foolish things that make us regret in future. This is why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So this verse also implies that it is foolish not to fear God. So this is the correct kind of fear that we should have. Therefore, brothers and sisters, do not be discouraged if you have fear because it is normal and God understands. To have fear is not a sin. However, if fear leads us to hold back our obedience to God, then fear has led us to sin. Please allow me to repeat. To have fear is not a sin at all. However, if fear leads us to hold back our obedience to God, then fear has led us to sin. A good example of such fear that leads us to sin can be seen in the parable of the talents. The third servant said in said this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, to his master, and I quote, And I was afraid, so I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what is yours. So the servant was afraid and did nothing to the talent that the master has entrusted him to multiply. The servant let fear cripple him and make him disobey his master. And the master was angry and said to him in verse 26 to 30, and I quote, the master said this, You worthless, lazy servant, did you know that I reap, I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Throw the bad servant out into darkness. There will be loud crying and grinding of teeth. Although it is normal to be afraid, but we should not let fear lead us not to have faith in following what God has told us to do and hence sin against Him. So is this happening to you now? What are you most afraid of God asking you to do and that you have let fear hinder you from obeying Him? Fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous and likely to cause pain or threat. Now, when your spirit is clogged or dominated by fear, your connection to God is affected. Please allow me to repeat. When your spirit is dominated by fear, your connection to God is affected. Solomon tells us in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, that the fear of man will prove to be a snare. Imagine an animal caught in a trap. It cannot perform its God's given function. Likewise, when you and I give in to the fear of man, we cannot do what God is calling us to do. So please do not let fear lead you to sin. 
Now, now that we have understood fear and come to know how fear can affect us positively as well as negatively, let us move on to the next sermon pointer, which is to understand courage. How courage can make a difference in our life. Now, just like fear, there are also two types of courage. The wrong type as well as the correct type of courage. So being courageous can be wrong too. It takes courage to walk into a casino and gamble, isn't it? Cheats and liars are also courageous people. Now, it requires courage to smuggle items past airport custom. Am I right? I can see some smiles. Some of you did that, right? For example, like smuggling durians. I know of people who successfully smuggled durians on the aeroplane. Husbands, I know you can identify with this one. <clears throat> now, it takes courage to forget or worse, ignore instructions from your wife, isn't it? Now, husbands have to suffer the painful consequences of being nagged at for not paying attention to our wife. But interestingly, we still do it. When someone challenges us to do the wrong thing and we courageously take up the challenge, then we are foolish. Now, have you heard of the TikTok Angel of Death Challenge? Anyone? Maybe some of the teenagers have heard of it. TikTok Angel of Death Challenge? Okay, I'm glad. Okay, at least this congregation is pure, yeah? <laughs> now, it happened just last year. In June 2022, I hope I don't shock you, teens, teenagers, were jumping in front of oncoming trucks in an attempt to make outrageous online content, but suffering fatal consequences. It's not happening in US or UK, you know. It's two Indonesian teenagers died due to the death of Angel Truck Challenge, including one 18-year-old in the city of Tangerang. Such courage is uncalled for and foolish and is definitely wrong. So, do not be foolishly courageous. What then is the correct type of courage? A direct way to explain this is that it is the opposite of the wrong type of courage. Therefore, simply put it, it is the courage to do what is right. The courage to do what is right and not the wrong thing. It is a courage to do what God wants us to do according to the Bible. Even when we become fearful regarding the needs, problems and sins in our life. Now, it's always easier said than done. When I say this, some of you will be wondering, how is it relevant to me? It's easy to say the right type of courage is to do the right thing. Now, if only courage can come in a pill or tablet that we can swallow and then we become courageous, that would be great, isn't it? If there's such a thing, I think all the elders of the church will look for it and give to each one of us. But it does not come in this way. Courage doesn't come easy. Although fear is natural, courage is not. Now, I do not think that anyone is born courageous. If you know of anyone is born courageous, let me know, okay? So far, I don't think anyone is born courageous. Courage is not in the list of spiritual gifts. If courage is inborn and it comes from the genes, then there'll be at least one person who, is com who completely has no fear in life. Moses, Elijah, and Peter became courageous through the years as they walked with God. It doesn't come naturally. Courage has to be learned, assisted, and developed. So knowing that courage is not inherited or natural and has to be acquired, 
We then move on to the, the third point of today's sermon outline, which is managing or overcoming fears. How we are going to move away from our usual way of handling fears and practically live our life courageously as overcomer. So don't bluff ourselves that courage is natural. It's not. We have to practically do something about it. Okay. In order to overcome that significant number one fear that you have identified at the start of the sermon, you have to practically do something. It is not just wait, do nothing, and hope that God will miraculously remove the fears from your life. Yes, maybe, but we cannot wait and do nothing and hope that God will remove the fears from you. So there are three steps that I have found from the Bible that speak of the formula, in a way, formula, to acquire courage. But there are three practical steps that the Bible mentioned to acquire courage. Now, every solution in life always starts from the Bible. So step number one is to read His Word, which is the Bible. Search for Bible scriptures that talk about the needs, problems, and sins and the fears that you're facing. There are many life examples in the Bible whom we can learn from as we read how they become overcomers of their fears. On top of this, you would be able to find many Bible verses that explain about life, about how God accepts and forgives us, about how God will be with us and help us to walk through the fears in our life, and about God's promises on our future and eternal life. And therefore, we do not even have to be afraid of death. Develop the habit of going to the main source of written knowledge, which is the Bible. The Bible is the light that shines through the darkness of all fears so that we can walk properly with the correct understanding of handling fear and that we are able to walk and progress without being held back. Now, I remember an experience I had when I started work in my first school, back in my home country. I was teaching mathematics, and I was a homeroom as well as a CCA teacher. The school was an all-boys, non-Christian school. Whenever any student from my homeroom or CCA had problems with friendship or at home, I would reach out to him and pray with him. And if opportunity arose, I would share the gospel with him. Now, by God's grace, a few boys responded. Then problems arise. A school leader came to know about it and approached me and warned me that I must stop praying with students in school campus and stop sharing the Bible or converting any student to Christianity. I was very shaken because my career path and income were threatened. And also I was afraid to strain the relationship with my superiors. So naturally, I became fearful when I went back to work after that day. And I stopped all prayers or sharing of gospel in school because I was afraid. And it went on like this for a month or more. I only started picking up my courage through my daily Bible reading. There were indeed many scriptures that encouraged us not to be afraid and that God would help us. So, being a relatively young Christian, I ideally believed that God will help me and remove my problems. So I discreetly went back to reaching out to my students. But surprise, the situation did not improve. And I still have to face resistance, if not more resistance, from that school leader who rallied one more teacher to spy on me. So there was no deliverance. And I was still fearful. So what should I do? Then, by God's grace, I read this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 
that stays with me to this day. And it reads, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Now, once again, God has used Bible passages this time to convict me of the purpose of doing His will and hence give me courage to do the right thing. So I'm not looking for problems to be removed. I'm not looking for miracles. But God has used His Word to give me the right conviction of doing His will. Even when I still face resistance and the situation did not improve. I no longer depend on answered prayers to find courage. But I find courage in doing God's will. That is what happened to me. Therefore, read the Bible daily. Look for answers from the Bible regularly if you do not want to be held back by fears. Do not be lazy. Be diligent. Go to the Bible and look for Bible verses that will speak to your fe- about your fears and about courage. Now, this is the first and very important practical step that we should take. Next, we need assistance. We need help from people too. Now, a team of football players need encouragement from the coach and each other to go to the field courageously, especially when they are facing a strong opponent team. Now, don't bluff ourselves to think that we can stand alone. And don't underestimate how good people around us can help us to overcome fears. So the next practical step is to talk to Christians in church, at home, at school, or, in, or at work. A word of advice. Please do not ask for advice from people who may then challenge you to have the courage to do the wrong things, like what I've mentioned earlier. For example, gambling to meet financial needs or cheat and lie to solve problems. So it is wise or is wiser to talk to people who knows the Bible and have lived their life accordingly. Talk to the church elders and Bible study leaders. Share your fears with members in the church community group whom you can trust. Ask advice from godly Christians at home, in church, in school or at work, whom you know have been Bible-obeying Christians. Now, continuing from my earlier testimony on me reaching out to students when I was a young teacher and how resistance from that school leader did not stop. I would like to share how my church friends and one Christian colleague at work helped me to remain courageous in the midst of fear. At first, I was so shaken and I felt ashamed to let anyone know about it. Somehow, after a while, I shared my fear with one of my church elders and also to my community group. Not only did they pray with me and affirm me that I did not do anything wrong according to the will of God from the Bible, they also came up with ideas on how I can still continue God's ministry all right, with my students. For example, by introducing some of my church people to my students or by inviting my students to church instead of doing it in the school campus. I felt supported and encouraged. And also I shared with one Christian colleague in school and both of us prayed and encouraged each other to remain faithful to the cause. Now I know for sure that all these people had helped me tremendously to overcome my fears and find courage to do the right thing. Now, these Christians had played an important role to keep me courageous in doing what God wanted me to do, even when I faced threats and resistance and became fearful. Now, in Acts chapter 4, we, we see how Christians help each other to remain faithful and courageous in the midst of fears. So do not, be, do not feel ashamed and keep things to yourself. Instead, you should share with fellow Christians and ask for help. 
If you, ha- if you have not tried it, you should. And you'll see how Christians can help each other to grow courageously in the midst of fears. Now, the last but definitely not the least practical step has to do with you making a decision to a commitment. It sounds simple, but it may not be easy. Because making a decision to commit is always difficult, although it's pretty straightforward. It is like making a decision to say yes to a marriage proposal. The third practical step has to do with saying yes to Jesus and trusting Him to lead you in all your present and future fears. The third practical step is to commit yourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus' leadership. Now, I find that it's an uphill task this morning for me to convince all of us to say a yes, to, to commit ourselves to Jesus' leadership. It's not just words. It has to do with a decision. That is why it makes it so difficult for me to talk about the third practical step. But I venture, I'll try. Okay? Please come along with me. Please follow me. Now, are you familiar with the Bible event where the 12 disciples were on the boat and then there was a fierce storm, but Jesus continued to sleep? Are you all familiar with this incident? Now, it may surprise you, yeah? Even the 12 disciples, as you can see on the screen, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, panicked and doubted Jesus in the storm, and they woke him up and said this, you know, to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now let's imagine, please follow me, that you are in a sinking ship or in a life and death situation. What will you pray to God? Most likely you and I will say, God, save me. God, help me. Right? Right? Now, likewise, the 12 disciples could have said to Jesus, help, help, save us. Instead, the 12 of them pushed the bar up a level and surprised us by saying to Jesus, don't you care? It shows that they were questioning Jesus' love and leadership when they were in a storm and feeling scared. Now, Jesus woke up and calmed the storm and said to all of them in Mark chapter 4, verse 40, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now, it is an uphill task or uh, 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 it's difficult because if the 12 disciples who were with Jesus every day and saw all the miracles that he had done, yet could become afraid and thought that Jesus did not care for them. Most likely, we can do no better than these 12 disciples. So honestly, I struggled on how to make this point across to all of us so that we don't trivialize it. The third practical point is very important. It's about commitment. It's about making a decision. So I struggled that, we ha- that I was thinking how to bring this across. That we have to go to our Lord Jesus with all our fears and trust in His leadership. Regardless, whatever the eventual outcomes, good or bad, whether there's deliverance or not, we have to go to Jesus and trust in His leadership. So when I was thinking of how to bring this across, I recall a HBO series production that speaks of courage, which I I watched two times when I was younger. Recently, I decided to watch it a third time. Okay? When I was asked to preach on courage, so I decided to watch a third time. 
And the title of the movie is Band of Brothers. Anyone familiar and watched this before? Anyone? Just a show of hands. I just want to know. Yes. Mostly men, yeah? <laughs> now, Band of Brothers, to give you all uh, the, the background, yeah? Band of Brothers is a 2001 production that based on actual true Second World War events. The series dramatizes the history of Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. From jump training in the United States, through, its particip through to its participation in D-Day on June the 6th, year 1944, and major war actions in Europe until the death of Hitler and the end of World War II. Now, what makes it worth watching is that the events are based on research and recorded interviews with Easy Company veterans who survived the war. So based on true accounts, we can pay attention to this movie, right? Because it's based on true accounts. All the soldiers were scared when they were at the war front, especially when they saw their fellow comrades killed by the enemy one after another. And there is no, it seems like the war is not, was not ending soon. There were times when the company of soldiers encountered great pain, loss and casualty. Why? Because of poor leadership of their captains. There was an incompetent captain who was not skilled in reading map and was poor in strategizing combat fighting. And then there was another captain, a different one, who was always missing when there were heavy crossfires with the Germans. And he would leave all decision makings to his sergeants and soldiers instead. So under these two captains, the soldiers had every good reason not to commit their lives to their captain's leadership. It's valid. Okay, because these two captains are incompetent. They're not even present. So why should they, you know, commit their lives, make their decision to give their life or even to follow the captain's leadership? The soldiers could not trust nor follow the two captains wholeheartedly because the leaders were incompetent and not present when needed. Okay, here comes the good part. Then they had this one good captain, all right, by the name of Captain Winters, who was so different from the first two captains mentioned. Now, Captain Winters was intelligent and smart in coming out with combat strategies and definitely skillful in all he did. Most importantly, he was always there with the soldiers when they needed him in the crossfires with their enemies. He would be the first to charge into the war front and fought alongside with his soldiers until the last enemy was destroyed or captured. The company of soldiers felt safe and confident whenever Captain Winters was around with them and leading them into uncharted, uh, uncharted enemies' territories. Therefore, they were although they were still afraid almost every day because the war was not over yet and situations were still uncertain. Now, this is the part. The soldiers, day by day, became courageous under the leadership of Captain Winters and they won the war and returned home safely. Now, don't bluff ourselves. All of us, need a good leader when we tread into the unknown. All of us, especially when we are facing a daily spiritual war, we need a good leader. Who is your leader? Who is your captain? We have our captain, the Lord. We have the captain of the Lord's host, our Lord Jesus, who is alive today and forevermore. He will not leave us as we face our daily fears. Jesus is wise and more than competent and 
definitely powerful in all situations. In fact, He is the captain of our life who has every present situation under control and He knows the future. Most importantly, His love is unconditional and we can go to Him no matter what. So what else more will we ask for? Tell me, in what areas is Jesus lacking that we cannot commit ourselves to His leadership and go to Him with all our fears? Is there any area that Jesus is lacking that we cannot commit ourselves to His leadership and go to Him with all our fears? We can become courageous under the leadership of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the last practical step is to have daily communion and fellowship with our Lord Jesus because we have decided to commit ourselves to His leadership. Go to the captain of our life, Lord Jesus. Pray and ask Him to help us to trust that He is in control. Let us lean not on our own understanding and felt scared by the storms around us like the 12 disciples in the boat. Let us not succumb to our fears like the disciples and question God, don't you care? Instead, let us remember how Jesus has the power to calm the storms and we should not be afraid. So it may be a frequent decision that we have to make when fears arise. Decide to say yes to Jesus. Commit to say, yes, I want to have a daily communion with Jesus and follow His leading. Even when prolonged bad situations continue and you are afraid. Believe that Jesus cares and that He will not leave us and is all-powerful and has all situations under His control and plans and will work all things for the good of those who love Him. Jesus is not some weak, incompetent and uncaring captain. He is our capable captain who runs alongside with us and would even sacrifice his life for us. Now think about the number one fear that I asked you to identify at the start of the sermon. How do you think you can relate that fear with your captain, Lord Jesus? Do you trust that He cares and that He will walk through that fear with you? Have a daily close communion with Jesus and you will see how He can change the way you perceive and manage your fears under His leadership. So before we end this time of sermon, In conclusion, it is normal to be afraid. Godly people also can become fearful. But do not let fear lead us to sins by holding back our obedience to God. Do not be like the third servant who hid the talent because he was afraid. Instead, God God wants us to live courageously for Him. But the problem is, Nobody is born courageous. Courage has to be learned, assisted and developed. Whenever we are afraid, there are three practical things that we can do. First, go to His Word, which is the Bible, to seek for knowledge, understanding and answers. Read the Bible daily and look for answers from the Bible regularly if you do not want to be held back by fears. Next, Go to His people. Go to Bible-obeying Christians for support, help and counsel. You do not have to be alone in your fears. We are all in this together. Third, make a commitment to His leadership. Remember the captain of our life, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is more than able to guide, protect and help you. And this captain loves you unconditionally and will not leave you as you continue to say a yes to Him leading you. In fact, He has conquered death 
and we have eternal life through Him. So we have nothing to fear when we have Him in our life. Now with this, I would like to end with this verse from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, as a benediction to encourage all of us and to assure us. And I read, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who will go, who goes with you, and He will not leave you nor forsake you. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to apply what we have learned from you today. Many times we are like the disciples who became fearful when they saw the storm around them, even though they had Jesus in the boat with them. We confess our weaknesses and our tendency to be crippled by fears and even allow fears to lead us not to do what you want us to do. Please forgive us and help us. May we be mindful to have daily communion with you and grow in faith and courage. Enable us to see past our weaknesses and challenges so that we may have the confidence under the leadership of our Lord Jesus. Grant us a strong sense of faith in you, knowing that you will always be there with us as we step into the unknown. We continue to commit ourselves to you and trust in your leading as we obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.